Hi, assalamu alaikum. My name is Shahada. I'm a final year medical student. As you can tell from the title of this video, we will be discussing mental illness. Because it is such a general term, I like to begin this video with an introduction to what mental illness is and what is encompassed under the term mental illness. It is a health condition that can involve changes to a person's emotions, thoughts or behaviours and it is often termed a mental illness when these changes cause significant distress to the person or it impairs that person's ability to function in social work or family activities. There are many different diagnoses that fall under this umbrella of mental illness and I think the best way to understand them is to understand the groups of mental disorders. So we have mood disorders in which depression and bipolar come under. Um, we also have psychotic disorders. One of the psychotic disorders is schizophrenia. We have eating disorders that include um, bulimia and anorexia. And we also have personality disorders. We have substance use disorders um, and many other groups of disorders which makes it easier to classify each diagnosis. There is a set of criteria that needs to be fulfilled before someone is diagnosed with um, a specific mental disorder. And what is commonly used is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, also known as DSM-5. Um, and this is a guide that helps uh, health practitioners to diagnose each person. Mental illness or mental disorders are more common than you think. Every 3 in 10 individuals above the age of 16 in Malaysia have some form of mental illness. The rates of suicide have only increased year by year. In 2019, there was a total recorded 609 cases of deaths by suicide and this number has climbed to 631 in 2020. And this year alone, in the first five months, police has recorded a total of 468 suicides. So the rates of suicide in Malaysia have been increasing at an alarming rate. And the topic of mental illness is an important topic, especially in the climate that we live in today. That's why I've invited Dr. Siva, an associate professor in psychiatry, to answer some of the questions that we may have on mental illness. I think uh, feeling sad is, uh, is, is, is one of our basic uh, emotions that we have. So all of us feel sad once in a while. But uh, what makes the distinct difference between uh, feeling sad and being clinically depressed uh, is one, the intensity, and two, the duration, and three, its consequences or implications. So what I mean is uh, a person who is sad would actually feel sad for a while and would have that ability to basically feel better or get better uh, when they, he or she basically does something that they like. Uh, but uh, people who are depressed or clinically depressed, uh, they don't have that ability. They are pervasively or sad for a long period of time. So that comes to the duration. You know? So when you're talking about a clinical depression, you're at least talking about down, low, sad, depressed for at least two weeks or more. Uh, now, you don't find that in just sadness. You know, sadness, you are down for a day, then something happens, a trigger, and the next day you're bouncing up, you know. And obviously, I think the third part is the consequences because uh, people who are clinically depressed um, don't function. So you see that uh, clinically, your personal, your social, your maybe occupational or academic functioning worsens, you know. So that's the main difference between uh, sadness as uh, an emotion and clinical depression as a disorder that affects you. If I tell a doctor that I've been hurting myself or that I don't feel like living anymore, will they take me away somewhere? Hmm. I think that's the fear that many people have, isn't it? And that's why people don't speak out or speak up. Um, 
Well, I think uh, an honest answer to that is uh, no. I don't think anyone can decide what's best for you without your involvement. So I think that's part of therapy, that uh, the client or the patient has a fair share in decision-making. So that's, that's, a, that's a collaborative uh, decision-making pack that we normally bring into uh, consultations nowadays. So it's no longer the doctor calls the shot. You know? It's going to be collaborative and uh, the patient or the client has a fair share of decision-making. And um, I think decision would be what's best for the client. The, the advice to people is go out reach for help uh, with or without. Now, the problem is in, in, in many countries, just like ours, um, when you are below 18, you know, there are certain laws that sort of uh, encourage people to go with parents, you know. But uh, there, there, there are such a ruling that, you know, you could also be a mature teen, you know, and make those decisions. So normally if um, a teen, and, and I'm talking about someone who is below 18, walks into a clinic, uh, a, a, a mental health clinic with their parents, um, normally what the doctors would do is the doctors would uh, talk to parent and the teen and then get the parent's permission to speak confidentially with the teen. You know? And... Um, from, from the, the next appointment wise, it's going to be just the therapist and the team. So uh, in, in mental health uh, confidentiality, that means client and therapist confidentiality is maintained despite what your age is, you know? Um, I think that the uh, pact is only broken on, yeah, two occasions. One, if the individual is suicidal, and wants to harm himself or herself, or if that individual has homicidal thoughts and ideas and wants to harm others, then that pact uh, breaks. Otherwise, no, it's, it's confidential and we do encourage people to walk in okay, with or without parents. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a very tough one. You know, that's a very tough one. I suppose uh, if you have actually identified that this friend of yours is uh, undergoing problems uh, and you have this gut feeling that it's depression, <clears throat> I think um, <clears throat> step number one is uh, to be there for him or her, to be uh, non-judgmental, to be uh, <clears throat> someone who is there just to lend a hearing ear, you know? to listen to their problems rather than to tell them what to do and uh, rather than to comment on what's right or what's wrong. But I suppose that uh, in the long term, in the long term, uh, the, the, the correct step would be to get them professional help because uh, it depends who you are and where you're, you are coming from and what your background is. You may not be able to give your friend the best of help. You know, even if you are a doctor and this is your friend, you may not be the right person or the best person to actually help him or her because of that conflict of interest that you have being a good friend, you know. So he or she basically needs someone neutral. Now, when I say uh, professional help, I don't mean a psychiatrist. You don't really need a psychiatrist to do all these things. Even a well-trained counsellor or a well-trained uh, uh, NGO, you know, can actually do that work, you know. So it's a, it's a gruesome uh, journey, you know, especially when people don't want to go. But just by being there and showing them that you're there, you know, listening to them, sort of lets them vent out. I think helping them to vent out some of their frustrations are good because uh, that's how suicidal thoughts and suicidal ideas uh, sort of... Uh, Start to develop when people keep it or harbor it within themselves. Venting it out is going to um, help reduce them.
you know. But along the way, the development should be to go get some professional help. And would you suggest that the first person, uh, for example, if I have a friend with uh, depression, then the first person I contact, should it be like a counsellor or should it be a family member of the person? It should be someone who, that the person is comfortable with. Mm. You know, uh, because uh, whoever the contact is um, has to be seeing the patient or will be seeing the patient for an extended period of time. So it must be someone whom the patient is comfortable with. Uh, whom the patient is happy to see without much fear or resentment, you know. Sometimes mm -hmm. the last people you really want to talk to are your family members. Not because you don't trust them, but because you feel uh, guilt. You feel you have let them down, you know. You feel that you have not kept up to their standards, you know, those kind of things. And um, what you mentioned was that to... Uh... A lot of suicidal thoughts begin because of the harboring, um, mm. and that's where the suicidal hotlines would come in handy, right? Yep, and that's 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 how befrienders and the other talk hotlines really work, because uh, you have to remember that almost, I mean, a huge proportion. I would say almost more than three fourth of uh, suicide uh, uh, people with suicide ideation are what we call as contemplators. So um, they have a, a thought in mind, but they are ambivalent. They're not sure whether, should I do it, should I not? So many a times they, they are looking for someone or something to help their cause. You know, Those people who have already made up their mind, it's a very small percentage. I would say it's not even more than 10% of total attempters. You know? So it's a very small percentage. Now, that, that people are more determined. Those people are not going to come out. They're not going to speak to you. You know, they know what they want and they've made up their mind. But the rest of them are contemplators. So just by talking to them, just by talking and, and leading them the right way may alter and change their plans. And that's how the defenders uh, help. You know, they talk to them. Uh, they are non-judgmental. They don't comment on anything. They listen to them and maybe, you know, give them a thought or two, you know, help them along the right way. And that changes their thoughts, you know. Mm. Okay. Fifth question. What should I do if someone I know tells me that they have suicidal thoughts? Um, I think the first thing you, you should not do is get shocked. Okay. The thing that we should not do is to get shocked, get all uh, flustered, um, you know, press the, the urgent, the, the, the red button and go around telling people, you know, I don't think that's, that's the last thing you should do. Uh, I think um, the, the thing that you should do, uh, we should do is maybe sit down uh, and, and listen to them, talk to them, let them talk it out, you know, let them talk it out, listen to what exactly the problems are why the suicidal problems, you know, and all those things. And along that way, you know, try to encourage them to start getting some help, you know. Sometimes uh, questions like, you know, is there someone whom I can talk to, you know, uh, to maybe help you with these problems, you know, those kind of things. So listening and, and understanding is actually much better as a first step rather than jumping the gun and getting alarmed. Okay, but mm. uh, the fact that someone has voiced that out and told you that uh, I, I do have suicidal ideation is a cry for help. You know, the mm. cry for help and cries for help shouldn't be uh, underestimated, shouldn't be, you know, belittled. That's the thing. The sixth question as compared to other illnesses, the treatment of mental illness like depression is something that many are not familiar with. So when we talk about antidepressants, how is it supposed to work? And are symptoms supposed to completely disappear? Mm. Well, um, generally what we say is we, we, we tend to tell people that um, depression is something fully treatable. And uh, the faster you get, the faster you speak up, the faster you get treatment, um, the better your chances are of, uh, you know, uh, getting better 
Now, uh, when, when, when I talk about treatment, I'm not just talking about using medicine. So it's a, it's a huge uh, armamentum that we have. All right. And I think all around the world internationally, we, we follow a same guideline. We can divide depression into different grades, <clears throat> mild or minimal, moderate, and uh, major. <clears throat> so those in the mild, uh, you can actually treat them well with alternative treatment, <clears throat> with uh, psychological methods, with counseling, you know, and you don't really need medication. Now, medication is normally for those who are in the moderate to severe, moderate to severe uh, area of depression. So uh, when I say uh, psychological methods, what I mean is uh, some amount of talk therapy. And a lot of people in Malaysia do a lot of talk therapy. Sometimes it's just support psychotherapy, you know, just listening, understanding, giving motivation. Uh, some are slightly more uh, intricate, like uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, where they talk about thoughts and helping people deal with thoughts and behavior. A bit more deeper than that would be things like uh, psychodynamic psychotherapy. That's talking about behaviors, talking about your past. There are also newer ones that have actually come up in the, the past two millenniums. Um, things like interpersonal therapy, you know, uh, something like uh, EMDR. So those are all different types of therapy. But what basically it means is you're sitting down, you're talking without the use of medication. Now, the other alternative to that is, of course, medication. And uh, how, how do medications work? The understanding in depression is that um, <clears throat> certain chemicals that keep our mood stable, um, there are two major chemicals. One is called serotonin. The other one is called dopamine. You know, these are all chemicals in the brain. And what they normally do is they keep your mood stable. So those are the chemicals that allow you to go to work, enjoy life, have a good sleep, enjoy life. I mean, enjoy what you're doing, you know, those kind of things. In depression, it's said to come down. So your levels <clears throat> of those chemicals come down. The medications that uh, we take or the antidepressants over a period of time help stabilize those uh, lowered levels of chemical back to its normal level. So it doesn't happen within a day or two. You know, it takes at least a couple of months and people are advised to be on medication at least for six to nine months. You know, that's a, that's a minimum amount of time. So it shows that it takes some time for those changes in the brain to take place. And once that uh, arises, then people are much stable. Um, Many people in mental health would actually tell you that uh, in cases of uh, moderate to severe depression, uh, they would actually advise you to combine both medication plus psychological, and that gives you a better chance of getting better. And following the question of uh, antidepressants, a lot of people are wondering whether antidepressants are actually supposed to make you feel happy or is it supposed to make you feel less sad or will it just make you feel numb to emotions? Hmm. It's a good question. Uh, you have to understand that, uh, we have to understand, uh, we're talking about different groups of antidepressants and the way they act. So the, the different mechanisms of action causes different feelings. Many a times you get people coming back you know, and saying that, doctor, I'm not crying as much as I do. Uh, I don't feel as sad as I do. You know, I don't get so hyper as, as I do. And, and doctors get overjoyed by this, you know. But when you really sit down and talk to them, you know, the only reason why they're not feeling that is because they feel numb. You know, they feel numb. So you can go shout at their face and they just don't feel anything. And that's sometimes the effect of the antidepressant. Okay, sad to say. So numb is not normal. Numb is not normal. Okay, humans need to feel. You, you, numb is not, is definitely abnormal. 
being sensitive, oversensitive is also abnormal. So uh, we've got to strike that balance with the different medications. So people, uh, different individuals react to different medications in a different manner. Okay. So it all, it's all up to the physician working closely with the patient to actually find the best medication to get the most efficacy and at the same time, the least side effects. So it's like a balance that you must find, you know, so it's not a, it's not, it's not a, uh, uh, everything fits the same bill, you know, it's uh, different patients react differently mm. to medication. And if someone um, is on antidepressants for a long time, is there a possibility that they will build tolerance towards the medication and causing it to stop working? Now, um, a, good, a good proportion of people are on medication for a good nine months to a year and manage to taper it down uh, successfully. But uh, as, as you have actually said, uh, Shada, there are some group of people who are basically on antidepressants for almost for life, you know. Um, reasons? Because every time they try to reduce it, uh, they are more prone for relapse and they just can't uh, go on with life normally. So the question is, do you get dependent on uh, antidepressants? Well, uh, the answer is no. The answer is no. Um, there are medications there that you get dependent on, and those common medications would be uh, benzodiazepines. You know, now you get dependent on that. Uh, so, all antidepressants can be safely tapered down and stopped. The reason why some people don't taper or choose not to taper is because uh, they, when, whenever they taper, they are prone to be affected by stressors, stress, and other environmental cues, bringing back, back the depression again when they go into a relapse. That's the reason. In that regard, can a person become addicted to antidepressants? We have really not heard of anyone being addicted because when you use the word addicted or the same thing you asked just now, the clinical mm. term for it would be uh, dependence. You have two elements. One is uh, when someone is dependent on a medication, you stop it, they have withdrawals. Now that doesn't happen. That doesn't happen, you know. And uh, two, you build tolerance. Now that also doesn't happen with <clears throat> antidepressants. So those are two uh, elements of addiction or, or dependence that you're looking at. You know? So no, you don't, you don't build an addiction not to antidepressant. If a person has no way of distancing themselves from a life stressor that is causing the um, depression, per se, um, will seeking psychiatric treatment be effective? So obviously, uh, like you said, uh, option number one in those scenarios would be to, to distance yourself you know, uh, with, uh, from the, the stressor. So let's say if uh, uh, I have my stressor comes from work, you know, and it's the work environment that, that gets me all stressed up and depressed. So uh, number one is obviously if I can't take it, if I can't manage it, then find a new job, you know, find a new job. That will be obviously uh, number one. Uh, but sometimes due to um, the job market and everything else, you know, you find that you just can't find something new and you have to stick on because you need that financial uh, cash to help with life. Then option number two is to learn how to deal with it, you know, while you're still sticking with it learning how to deal with whatever happens. And that's where therapy comes in. You know, that's where therapy comes in. And that's where therapy can help dealing with the thoughts that go on and how to, to overcome those thoughts in a non-malignant or non-injurious manner. You know, that means you don't hurt yourself or you don't harm yourself, you know, and you can basically get over it. So therapy can actually help with that. Teaching you safer ways healthier ways to overcome problems. 
sometimes the reason that individuals are hesitant to seek treatment is because of the fear of being labelled with a diagnosis. Which brings me to the next question. If I am diagnosed with a mental illness, will I need to inform my employer? Hmm. Right. So I think stigma is a huge thing, uh, especially um, in mental health and more so around the Asian region. It's a trick question, actually. Um, and it also depends on what occupation you are in, you know. And um, <clears throat> the, um, how, I mean, what, what the country's uh, policies are. Now, if you were to ask me uh, generally, you know, so let's not just talk about Malaysia, anywhere in the world, I, I would say that your mental health problem is your personal issue, you know. And uh, I don't think anyone would, should actually have the right to, to, to sort of uh, intrude into that, you know, unless permission is actually given. But uh, when you talk about certain occupation, now then, uh, which, which basically has, have, have other issues pertaining to that, it becomes an issue. Like, for example, a doctor, you know. So if I have a medical problem <clears throat> and I'm a doctor, I become a doctor, should I inform the ministry. Now, in Malaysia, there was, uh, I think this was uh, released by our previous DG of health, Ismail Marikan, uh, many years ago, uh, that uh, there is a standing uh, uh, order that uh, any doctor with a mental health problem should declare. Or if a doctor goes and gets treatment from any clinic, you know, uh, the, the treating doctor should declare. Should declare. Now, where does those understanding come from? Uh, the ministry themselves, you know, looking, looking at those things from the, from the eyes of the ministry, the ministry says that, you know, you're working with the ministry and you're looking after patients. Now, the patients are the ministry's responsibility. So, if anything goes wrong, yes, the doctor gets a rap, but it's the ministry which takes up the responsibility, you know. So, after all, you know, we are in charge of it. So we want to make sure that if you're treating someone, that you are fit. So I think from the ministry's point of view is they just want to make sure that you are healthy and fit for practice. Um, in my experience so far, I have not seen a direct, uh, what would I say, uh, misconduct or misappropriateness in terms of mental health issues. I think the, the ministry is quite uh, fair and, uh, and it tolerates uh, mental illness well. We've got a number of doctors with mental health illness. I mean, as, as a human being, there is always a chance that, you know, you have any one of those mental illness. And uh, I think the ministry has been fair enough to to uh, oversee and give them opportunities and maybe place them in areas where they are not so stressed, you know. So, um, but by doing that, you know, the ministry says that uh, you must be monitored by someone from the hospital and there must be some report that goes on, you know. And even prior to you starting work, there must be uh, an interview which sort of uh, decides whether you're fit to practice. So, Coming from the point of the patient or the client, now it could be very intrusive. It could be very intrusive because you lose autonomy. You lose autonomy, you know, because you can't choose, you can't say anything, and you're under the mercy of the ministry, you know, despite whatever. Humans are humans, you know, Shada, and um, as much as I can say that uh, there is no prejudice from the ministry, but, you know, when the news is out there, people will shun you, you know. People will shun. There, there, there are certain people. I, I work with clients who are, uh, who are still in the ministry, who are still working, and those who have gone out and couldn't manage because of this uh, stigma and stopped. You know? So there, there are people who are going to look at you in a strange way, a strange manner. So you know, when it comes there, it, from, from a client's point of perspective, you've lost autonomy. So it's, it's, it's very tough. So that's, that's where my conclusion is. It's actually up to your client, up to the client. That's, that's basically yours, your responsibility. And that's why I keep telling people it's your responsibility. As long as 
you don't, as long as you take care of yourself and you make sure that you're fit for practice, I don't think anyone's going to ask you questions. When you start slacking, when you start uh, defaulting treatment and you stop medication, you know, that's where problems start. So it's a bit more tough when you're in the uh, public sector. In the private sector, uh, well, you, you are your own boss. So that's okay. That's okay. There is, there, and there should not be any prejudice. In my practice, yeah. I've got, yeah, I've got doctors who have got an anxiety problem. I've got doctors who have got uh, depression. Depression is the most, actually. Um, a couple of them with bipolar, bipolar one. Okay. Very rarely schizophrenia. Okay. So just because someone's been diagnosed with schizophrenia does not mean that they can't work. You know, the fact is it's, it's going to be an, a, a more difficult task, an uphill task, keeping yourself well. But as long as you're well, it's okay. When I was in early practice, I always, we always looked at the ministry as an enemy. Uh, you know, everyone likes to look at uh, the government sector or the, the, the public sector as enemies. But, you know, when you really deal with them, you know, they're not that bad. You know, I would say that if you want to compare public and private, you know, I would say the public sector is so very understanding. Even if you have a problem, they don't sack you immediately. Not like the private mm -hmm. sector. You're working for a company, you know, all they need is a little bit of reduce in productivity and you're out. Now, the public sector doesn't do that, you know. So we've got very well set guidelines in the public sector, especially under MOH, for doctors and clinicians with a mental health problem and how it should be, how the monitoring should be. So it's all well set in a guideline. And it goes a little yeah. something like...